So here the next church that we're focusing on, the next church that the angel is being written unto that oversees the particular church is Pergamos, beginning in verse 12. And to the angel in the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Again, we know that this is Jesus Christ. Specifically back in Revelation 1 and verse 16, it says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The next part that you'll see this two-edged sword mentioned is in Revelation chapter 19 and in verse 15. Revelation 19 and verse 15 where it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So here, not specifically a two-edged sword, but you can by extension grab a hold of that sharp sword that is proceeding out of his mouth is the same one. What is the sword out of his mouth? Well, this is very word. It's the word of God. Here, both times appropriated to the mouth of our Savior, the mouth of our Lord, in which it would come forth. And Revelation 19 talks about him judging the nations, ruling them with a rod of iron, treading the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God by that very sword that proceedeth out of his mouth. The sharp sword, the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth aforetime in Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 2 was used to judge individuals. Here the religious leaders are judged by the two-edged sword that is proceeding out of the mouth. Truth be told, the two-edged sword that proceeds out of our Lord's mouth will judge everybody. All nations, kindreds, tongues. Everybody will be put under that litmus test of the Word of God. And what you have done with the Word of God will determine your final position. Hey, if we were all judged who should stand. But glory be to God, the same one judging by the sword that proceedeth out of his mouth is the same one that provided for us a way by which we can be saved from the wrath of Almighty God that ought to be upon us for our sins and for our deeds and for our transgressions against the word. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, The word of God, and here's where we make that connection. We don't just need to look at where it's proceeding out of his mouth and by extension say, Oh, that must be the words that he is saying. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 actually says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Here as a divider of asunder, here a breaking asunder, here the Bible refers to as the word of God cutting through, it says of the soul and spirit. Well, this is the spiritual application. This is where God judges by his sword, dividing asunder the soul and spirit, the spiritual idea, the spiritual aspect of man. But it doesn't stop there. The word of God also separates the joints and the marrow. This is the physical aspect of man that are brought into judgment before the word of God. The quick, living, powerful, and sharp word of God as it cuts through the joints and marrow. And the last is that it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is the motives of it all. It's interesting because we can appear spiritually right. We can, appear, we can appear physically right. But once the thoughts and intents of the heart are judged, quite often that's where we fall, right? We come to church. We wear the suit. We look right. We talk right. We act right. Everything seems to be in order. But were God to take his word that is quick and powerful and sharp and divide asunder the very thoughts and intents of our own hearts, that's where I believe most Christians would really fall short. That brain is a battlefield, and that flesh has, has, has equal ground upon it. That's where the greatest spiritual warfare takes place. It's between the thoughts and intents of my heart, where my spirit, which is resurrected and alive, desires to do right, but my flesh desires the exact opposite. And these two go at each other. And truth be told, my flesh wins quite often, especially up into these places. Yeah, you won't often see me act out what goes on to my mind, but that's because the battle has been won in that area. That's because I overcame in that area. That's because I didn't allow for the flesh side to win the thoughts and intents of my heart and to overcome. But the reality is, is that sometimes I'll even do good things and I'll do them for the wrong intentions. And that's just, that's just the statement that could be made about each and every one of us. 
Thanks be to God that the word of God is powerful and it discerns these things. So that when I see that the thoughts and the tents of my heart are not right, I can make the decision to do right. When I see that the soul and spirit of me is not right, I can be cut by the word of God and make the decision to do right. The very joints and marrow, how my flesh behaves as it's cut by the word of God, I can make the decision to do what is right or to do what is wrong. That's what the sword does. It divides and then you got to choose sides. It cuts asunder, and then you got to pick which way you will proceed. Verse 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. I love this. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now again, all things are naked and opened with the people that I'm in fellowship with, with the family that I walk before, with my co-workers, with my loved ones. All those things aren't open, but God has opened all things and they're all naked and they're all present. They're all visible to his sight. And that's the one with whom we have to do. That's the one with whom we have to please. That's the one with whom our very judgment rests. And we need to make sure we are right in his eyes. Verse 14 says, Seeing then we have a great high priest which is passed into heaven, let us hold fast that profession. The profession is the very word of God. And we need to grab a hold of what the word of God says as it's transmitted to us through the pages of this Bible, as it was transmitted from heaven, even as the church is receiving of John, we need to hold fast that profession. We want, as believers, to, be, to have the Word of God on our side. We want the Word of God to be aligning with our deeds and our acts. But it's even better when we are on the side of the Word of God. The Word of God is always right, but we need to endeavor to be on the side of the Word of God. And that's where our true victory lies. If you would, go to Psalm chapter 149. Psalm 149. It's one of the last psalms there. And as always, keep your finger in Revelation. We'll be back there eventually, Revelation 2. In Psalm 149, the Bible begins to describe the great joy and the great victory that comes from the saints who are on the side of the Lord, who are in line with the Word of God. Psalm 149 in verse 5, it says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all the saints. Praise ye the Lord. Here talking to the honor that the saints have. The word of God, if they were to have that sharp two-edged sword in their hand and the praises of God in their very mouth, the word of God gives them power to execute the judgment upon their very leaders. Yes, we are to lead, we are to yield ourselves to the leaders that have authority over us in as much as they are not driving us away from keeping the will of God. But here it's describing a king or a ruler that is absolutely driving you away from the will of God. Here it says, if the high praises of God are in our mouth, that two-edged sword of the word of God in our hands, we can execute judgment upon the heathen, punishments upon the people, bind their kings with chains and nobles with their fetters of iron. In other words, they're not going to be able to move were it not for the word of God allowing them to do so. This is the sharp two-edged sword that is in our hands. And it's interesting as you read through the passages in, in Revelation, you can go to uh, Proverbs chapter 5 if you would. But it's interesting when you see the church in Ephesus, it talks about them as a fighting church, but one that needs to have more faith, more trust in themselves. And it talks about Smyrna, one that's bought to great poverty and persecution. They have a great need to trust more in him, even if they are slain, that there's a better resurrection waiting. And now we're talking to the church in Pergamos, and what's being encouraged here, it seems that they would stand unfeigned in faith in the word of God that they have before them. This is why Jesus comes to them and introduces himself as the sharp two-edged sword. This is what you got to stand on, the sharp two-edged sword. You, are, you have the high praise of God in your mouth, that two-edged sword in your hand, and you can bind the kings. You can capture the nobles within a fetter of iron. And this was the, this was the issue that the Pergamos church had, and you can see it. Why? Because they are the one that has Satan's seat where they're living. They're the one that dwelleth where Satan lives. So what greater challenge could this church have been facing than to have the very, the, the very 
demon that was once singing praises of God in heaven, the, 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 the devil himself ruling over the very habitation where they're living. And God knows it's so. This is why he comes to them and, and gives the example of the two-edged sword. They need to look to a psalm like this, have high praises, and the sword in their hand in order to come through. But th this isn't the only two-edged sword that the Bible contains. And this is the warning that's going to come to a church like Pergamos that needs to have faith Unfeigned. If you look in Proverbs chapter 5, there's another. And the warning and the exhortation is given just as it is to them. It's given unto us. And that's to stand here on the word of God. My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear unto my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. So here, referring to the word of God, the wisdom, the understanding, the knowledge of God, we are to attend, bow, regard to, and keep it. Why would we need to do that? Why? Because, verse 3 begins to explain, the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. Her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, and look at this, sharp as a two-edged sword. So here, the only sword in the Word of God isn't the Scriptures, isn't the one proceeding out of the mouth. Here it says that the strange woman, her end is wormwood and bitter as it. Her end is that sharp two-edged sword dividing asunder, right? It's able to cut. It's able to do all the same things in as much as the Word of God is. But glory to God, he said his Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. So we always have the victory through the Scriptures, but know that there are other two-edged swords waiting to take you down. Verse 5 says, Her feet go down to death, and her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, O therefore, ye children, depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Lest thou give, here's the warning, lest thou give thy honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn as at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Here, it's talking about how the woman, her end that is bitter as wormwood, her end that is sharp as a two-edged sword, seems to have a similar effect predominantly upon the flesh of men. It says that she, she will be able to take the wealth. It will be cut from you. Strangers will take of thy labors. Your honor will be cut away from you and removed. You will mourn as at the last. Your flesh and your body will be consumed if you succumb to her allurement, if you succumb to the draw that the strange woman has so much upon this world. And say, verse 12, well, after all this has come to pass, lest you should say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear unto them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and the assembly. So we often think that the one that's going to fall to the strange woman, the one that's going to be allured by her words, the one that's going to be drawn in and cut by the two-edged sword that she has, is somebody that's out in the world. But here, he's talking to his son. My son, my son, attend, bow, regard, keep the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that is offered to you. Remove not the words of my mouth from you. Depart not from those words of my very mouth. And he says... And the reality is, is that when the person succumbs to the strange woman, when he looks back, he sees, I've hated instruction. I despise reproof when it came my way. I didn't obey the teachers that came into my life that were given to me by the word of God, that were given to me by God himself. I didn't incline my ear unto the instruction. And it says in verse 14, I was almost in all evil out in the world while I was doing bad things and worldly things, right? No, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. So here's why I say the danger is quite often not just the acts of the flesh, not just the spiritual acts that we're portraying, but it's the thoughts and intents of the heart. Here we see that the son that's being instructed toward wisdom was in all evil in the midst of the congregation and the assembly. He was in church. He was meeting with the body. He appeared religious. He was doing religious things. Spiritually, the guy looked good. Uh, in the flesh, he looked good. He was doing the right things. 
but it appears his heart was far from the instruction of the teachers. It was far from the word of God that was trying to get a hold of the word of the mouth of the preacher. The attendance, the bowing, the regard, the keeping of the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding was far from him, and it started from his heart. He said, I hated instruction. My heart despised reproof. And that was a great mourning and a great loss that came upon him as he re read these things and as he looked back upon his life. This other sword is indeed dangerous. Now, glory be to God that his sword is stronger, but be forewarned. There is a danger in being tripped up by the strange woman, and this danger is especially present to churchgoers, just like the one in Pergamos, just like the one that I'm standing before today. Like I said, all of these churches that we've already talked about had different um, intricity, in, different ideas, different uh, themes about them. Ephesians, they were a fighting church, and we see that in the book of Ephesians. We see that they're the ones that, that had the sword, the whole armor. They were a battling church, but quite often they were doing it in the flesh. Smyrna was a falling church. In other words, they were just ready to be steamrolled and destroyed by the Jewish leaders that were over top of them. Pergamos here, it seems to indicate that they were in the very belly of the beast, and they were feigning themselves to be a church. They were feigning themselves to to be spiritual. They were doing the works. They were doing the spiritual works, the fleshly works, and all of those things. But their risk was that they would be at risk of being phonies. They would be feigning the faith that they have. And this is why their encouragement is that they would have faith unfeigned. It would be sincere, and it would be acted upon accordingly. Go back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And this is the great risk that they had. They were in the congregation in the place where Satan dwelleth. So their danger is that they could have, have, have been drawn of, have, have been enticed by the strange woman, Satan's minister, and drawn away of their own lusts and enticed them, fall into that entrapment. Verse 13 says, I know thy works, and I love that God says that about all the churches. I know thy works, and this, and where thou dwellest. Sound words. God knows where you dwell. He knows that we're living in Toronto. He knows that we're living in Canada. He knows our works while we're living here in Toronto, Canada, and all the things that that entails. I know thy works are where thou dwellest. Here to Pergamos, he says, even where Satan's seat is. Interesting thing about Pergamos is that, is that it was, it was in, a, in amongst, again, Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos were all, were all kind of vying positions to be the greatest of the cities, the capital city, the chief city. Of Pergamos, it said that actually the great, the great statue, the great, great theater, the great uh, temple of Zeus was actually present there. Zeus and Athena being the, the, the god and goddess, the, the chief ones of the many within the uh, uh, old, old times. Now that same seat where Zeus dwelt, apparently, which was in Pergamos, is in Germany. It's in, it's in uh, a city in Germany. They've recreated it. So you can go and you can just look at Satan's seat if that's your, if that's your point of interest. But, but here, God is pointing to that church and he's saying, I know where you dwell. I know where Satan's seat is. But I like this. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where an Antipas was my fatal, faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. So both we see that Satan sits there and Satan dwells there. This is, Pergamos is, is, is Satan's place. This, this is where he resides. This is where he lives. He would have been, I believe, typified by, by Zeus at the time, the chief of the gods of the world at that time. And here, he, God is just affirming, hey, I know your works, and I know that you dwell where Satan dwells. I know that you're dwelling at the point of influence where Satan would do all his work. This is his very home. But despite this, you're holding fast my name. You have not denied my faith. And it says, even when Antipas was martyred among you. So there was some persecution and some suffering. But unlike what you saw in Smyrna, where God's basically saying, hey, I, I'm the resurrection. And, and when many of you are just are just destroyed and killed. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you up again. You will not be heard of the second death. Keep that faith. Here to the church in Pergamos, his, his, his real focus isn't to, to, uh, to, 
to help those that would be martyred. I don't believe that this church is under a great amount of persecution. Why? Because he says, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr. And it's all singular. He, he's calling out a single martyr. Whereas the church previous, Smyrna, it, it, it looked like just the whole church was about to be martyred. The whole church was about to be brought to judgment by the Jews at this time. Here, Pergamos was probably a, a less of a Jewish um, less of a Jewish leadership and, and more just Gentile. And we know that the Jews are the ones that are most likely to come down with heavy persecution on the believers. And so what had happened was that Pergamos church was given liberty to live in amongst them, even though they're living in the very place where Satan dwelleth, even though they're living in the very place where his seat was. Because of that, because they were given liberty to dwell there in amongst the worst kind of filth, what their tendency was, was to come under the influence of that and risk stumbling themselves. Does that make sense? It would be today, like you live in maybe New York, you live in Los Angeles and Hollywood. Here we live in Toronto and there's all sorts of filth and disgusting things. Satan has seats here. And if it's not himself, it's probably some devil that just have, has a chief seat here. And God knows that. So the risk to a church like this, because we're not being we're not being steamrolled. God's not giving us the message that we need to we need to uh, hold fast to the faith of the resurrection because because we're we're destined to die tomorrow. No, we we've been given liberty to dwell here. We're meeting here publicly. We're putting our stuff on the internet. In, in, in as much in as much as we can at this time, we have freedom to do what we're doing, even as I believe the Pergamos Church has. Verse fourteen. From the standpoint of understanding, I know where you dwell, where Satan's seat is, and where Satan lives. You hold fast my name, and you have not denied my faith. Well, verse 14 says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast dared them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast the stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So we see here that, this, according to the story of Balaam, you can turn to Numbers chapter 22. Keep your place. Turn to Numbers 22. We see here the story of Balaam. It goes such that he was hired by Balak to curse Israel. He was hired to pronounce a curse upon them because he was a, a great orator, because he had the power to, to move God at times. He, he seemed to be one that was doing right according to God. And so Balak saw the opportunity to bring Balaam under his, under his uh, leadership and, and he would curse him. But he said no. Numbers chapter 22 and in verse 12, the Bible says, And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuses to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went into, their, into Balak and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. Over in verse 25 it says, And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. So here what's happening is that Balaam was charged to curse the people. God said no, for the people are blessed. He refused for a moment, saying that I'll do what God has said, but afterward goes anyways. If you look in Numbers 23 and verse 12, after that he started to go, God began to do signs upon him. One of them is that the, the, the dumb ass, the ass that could not speak, pushed him against the wall and pushed him against the wall and pushed him against the wall until he thrust the donkey and then the donkey finally spoke and basically just said, you're outside of God's will. In verse, 20, or verse 12 of chapter 23, and he answered and said, must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? And Balak said unto him, so the second iteration, he comes to Balaam and tries to get him to curse. And he says, I need to speak what the Lord speaks. And Balak says, come, I pray thee with me unto another place from whence thou mayest see them, being the children of Israel. Thou shalt see but the uttermost part of them and shall not see them. Curse me them from thence. So he's trying again to get Balaam to curse him. 
And it's interesting because sometimes when, when, when we say, what we should do is when we say, no, I'm not doing that, that's against the word of God. And we back away. What we see with Balaam is he says, no, I'm not doing that. That's against the word of God. But he still toys with the temptation. He's found himself back again with Balak the second time, the third time, trying to find, we'll, we'll find out from the Bible, an opportunity to do precisely what God didn't want him to do. Chapter 24 and in verse 12, And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers which thou sentest unto me? If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. It sounds like Balaam's doing the right thing here. He says, pay me what you want. But I'm not going to curse this people. Pay me whatever, all the gold, all the silver, but I will not curse this people. But 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15 says, He loved the wages of unrighteousness. And so we know that even though Balaam keeps saying, I'm not going to curse the people, I'm not going to curse the people, I'm not going to curse the people, that for the wages of righteousness he is going to find some other way. And that, that plays it out in chapter 24 and verse 25. It says, And Balaam rose up and went returning to his place, and Balak also went his way. So again he refuses and says, I'm not going to do it, and they seem to have part ways. But as soon as we play into chapter 25, we see this. And Israel bowed in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto their sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down unto their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So Balaam, loving the wages of unrighteousness, as is revealed in the scriptures of Revelation, 2 Peter, Jude, and other places, found another way. He taught Balak to cast the stumbling block before them. And this is why I love Revelation and, and the revelation that comes from the New Testament. Because if you were just to read this, you find Balaam walks away, and then you don't read about him until he's later on killed in a different war. But what finds, follows immediately after he walks away is the great sin of whoredoms, eating and eating idol or eating meat sacrificed unto idols. And we're wondering, hey, how did this all come to be? Well, the New Testament tells us, even in the scriptures that we are reading, that it was Balaam that taught Balak to cast that stumbling stone. And I believe in the end, Balaam got the wages of unrighteousness that he sought over. Yeah, he didn't curse the people and he wanted to do what God was saying in that area. But being, being the advantageous guy he was, he found another way to get the job done. And he had Balak teach the people to cast the stumbling block, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. And this drove the Lord to anger for the people, and in the end, the people of Israel were, were cursed because they had disobeyed God here. Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and 29 says, and this was regarding the conversation, we can go there, Acts chapter 15, regarding when the, the question was posed to the disciples, or rather the charge given by Judaizers, they said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. And so I'm going to talk about the two stumbling blocks that were placed before the children of Israel. Eating things sacrificed unto idols and committing fornication. Now regarding the question or regarding the charge that came from Judea, you got to be circumcised to be saved. A council got together of believers and they assembled and they came to the conclusion that you find in verse 28 and 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So they determined that it was not of being circumcised to be saved. They, they wiped that away. But here they're going to give their, their interpretation of what the Holy Ghost taught them and what they thought, not laying burdens on them, but rather giving them necessary things. I feel that's one in the same. But he says this, That ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. So here the great discussion leads them to basically two conclusions. One about eating meats offered unto idols, blood, and strangled meats, and the other in regard to fornication. Now, both of these are specific 
commandments of the Old Testament. And therefore, up until a point, they would be legitimately applied if they were ever changed, right? So if Christ stepped in and said, okay, fornication is okay and eating meat sacrificed unto idols, then we would need to go with what Christ said because he has made an end of the law, the, this, the ordinances and the commands of old. But Christ didn't do this. So the disciples came to this conclusion based on what they believed the Holy Ghost was leading them. And they asked about what things would be applicable today to tell the Gentile church to maintain. Now, is fornication and the, and the, and the commandment against it applicable today? The answer is a hard yes. Go to the video, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 5. Absolutely, the law still maintains that fornication is a wicked and heinous sin before righteous God. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So here, the Apostle Paul comes upon a situation that was reported commonly. He wasn't even at Corinth at the time, but he heard this common report that there was fornication among them, and it was so gross, it wasn't even something that the Gentiles were into at that time. And they were puffed up in it, and they were embraced it, and they didn't fight against it. They, they, they emboldened themselves in the fact that they had had that same sin upon them. And this is something that you would expect like the church in Pergamos to have, where they dwell where Satan's seat is, so would a Corinthian church that dwells in a similar place where idolatry is rampant. They have a God of everything, and they were a very idolatrous nation, and now the Spirit of God has entered into them. Some of them have believed, and yet they still have that spirit of letting some things of their old life slide, letting that be okay. They were puffed up, when they should have mourned about this. And it says this, He that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. The charge from the apostle was that if there's a fornicator in the church, he needs to be removed. He needs to get out. With such an one, don't even eat. The Bible says in verse 5, To deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Throw him out in the street where Satan dwells. Throw him out in the street where Satan's seat is. In verse 9, he says, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, an idolater, a railer, a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one no not to eat. At the end of verse 13 it says, Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. If anybody is caught in this church to be in the act of fornication, to be involved in relationships that are outside of marriage or pre-marriage, they will be cast out of the church. The Bible commands it and demands it so. Fornication is still a wicked sin, and it will ruin a church. That's why the Apostle Paul was so hard on it, and he said, put away from among yourselves. Not that you need to go out of this world, because when we walk the streets, we sh we're going to run into fornicators, adulterers, liars, thieves, murderers. Who knows what we'll run into out in this world? We can't very well leave the very place that we're living and go and dwell in some commune in the middle of the woods. But no, we are not to company if they're called a brother, verse 11 says, with anyone that fits, fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner. We come to people and in a spirit of meekness try to get them to get these things right. And if they don't, don't even eat with them. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The Bible commands. If you turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 13. Just across the page. The Bible says, meats for the belly. And belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. This is kind of, kind of talking about the, the temporal state that we're in. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up by his own power. If we continue reading, it says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. 
What? Know ye not that which is joined unto a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. This is a saved person. And he charges this, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body, and by extension the body of Christ, the church that we reside in. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And when you sin, the sin of fornication, you're sinning against God. You're not glorifying Him in your body and in your spirit. Those things that belong unto God. You're not giving due reverence unto the temple of the Holy Ghost that abides within you. You are sinning against your body and you need to flee these things. This is the charge. The body is not for fornication, but it belongs unto God. Fornication in Galatians 5 is referred to as one of the works of the flesh. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. And in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8, when Babylon falls, it engulfs many around them because they are cut up in the wrath of her own fornication. As she falls, she takes them with her. By her own wantonness, she draws the fools away unto the lust of their own concupiscence. Now regarding fornication it's an easy deal it's an easy topic it's, it's one that the bible is just so from and it condemns on it we know that adam and eve were created and they became one flesh and that is normal that is acceptable that is right the proper order of things they are married they come together they are one flesh Jesus taught that, the disciples taught that, the Old Testament taught that. This is good and right. And as you read through Leviticus, you're just going to find all sorts of strange things that the world is doing that are, have no place within the realm of the believers, within the realm of the body of Christ. Regarding meats, then, we saw fornication. Absolutely, yes, it's applicable today. Regarding meats, then, I would say that this is a sometimes command. Well, what do I mean by that? Go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 and verse 9. <clears throat> now we see clearly that one of, the, one of the stumbling blocks that Balaam laid before the people and that were before the people here in the book of Revelation was not only fornication, but was eating things sacrificed unto idols. Now regarding me, let's go to Acts chapter 10 and in verse 9. And here we find Peter's vision. It says, On the morrow... As they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven opened in a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice unto him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Here I believe what's being explained here. Is, is God is using the picture of the sheet with every type of unclean beast of the Old Testament laid upon it. He says, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. If you were to look over in verse 34, it says, and Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no specter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him, and he begins to preach the gospel unto these people. Peter was a hard-headed guy. We find him de denying the Lord. We find him going fishing when he said don't. All these things Peter did, and he, he, it took a while for him to get things. Even this very vision, the Bible says, came unto him thrice, in verse 16. And this was done thrice, and the vessel received up again into heaven. I believe that all of the Old Testament and samples came to this point where God would use them to reveal unto a hard-headed apostle named Peter that the Gentiles could be saved. He used 
the, 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 the clams and the, and the shrimp and the, and the camels and, the, and the, all the restrictions, the dietary restrictions. And I believe if you look at them, there's great wisdom in some of the things. A lot of the things, especially like pigs, not only are they an unclean beast because they roll around in their own filth, but they also eat a lot more than they actually give you for flesh when you consume. So if you're wandering around in the desert, the last animal that you want to keep is a pig because they're just going to eat too much and you won't get a lot of yield out of them. So you see lots of wisdom contained within the different portions of the scripture and why you would give them to them. But what I believe is that he brought all of these to a point where he could drop them before Peter, say, Peter, rise kill and eat to the point that Peter would open his mouth in verse 34 and say, all this happened to prove that God is no respecter of persons, that it's not just the Jews, that it's every nation that feareth him and worketh righteousness that can be accepted with him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, the preaching of peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That Lord, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began in Galilee after the baptism of John, which is peace, which was after the baptism of John, which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with them. And we are witnesses of these things. God raised him up at the third day and showed him openly. Not to all people, but those chosen to the end that verse 43 comes to fruition to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Here the apostle Peter gives by the Holy Ghost these exact words and proclaims that they are true and he came to the revolution through, revelation through keeping of the Old Testament law and keeping of those carnal ordinances and keeping of those dietary restrictions. When God said, hey, rise, kill, and eat, he said, what I, he said, I have never touched anything uncommon. And God said, I have cleansed it. Call not thou uncommon. I have cleansed it. Call it not common. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 8 begins in this vein. So we see the immediate um, thing is that you see Peter coming to this revelation and it was because of the ensample of the Old Testament dietary restriction that he could even come to this revelation. If you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, there's an entire chapter then dedicated to the topic of meats sacrificed unto idols. I have very few notes here, but I just want to walk through these scriptures and give you my interpretation. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. So here we're talking to a group of believers that has knowledge, specific knowledge regarding this topic and others. They're grown a little bit. They understand some biblical truths. But he says this, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So he's trying to bring the topic from knowledge, bring the focus from knowledge unto charity which edifieth. That's, I believe, why he made that brief statement there. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So here again, he, he's saying, yeah, we all have knowledge. Knowledge is going to puff you up. If you think you know it, you don't even know as much as he ought to know. Charity edify. That, that's the focus of those first few statements there, those, those first few sentences. But if any man love God, verse 3, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know, so this, these are the ones that know something, right? Charity edified, but you do know something. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. And we all know that, right? These idols, these statues, we look at people bowing down to them and worshiping, and we're like, man, that is so dumb. It's just a piece of brick. It's just a piece of wood. What in the world are you doing? These idols are nothing in the world. And we know this. And this is what he's talking about. That idol is nothing in the world. Verse 5, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be many gods and many lords, as there be gods many and lords many, both lowercase here, but... To us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, and we by him. So there's a stark contrast to what the world sees and what we see. The world has gods, and there's all sorts of gods. You've, incurred, you, you've encountered this at the door. Well, what about the God of this and the God of that? And there's so many gods, and we all, if we all just do good by whatever God we feel fit, then we'll get to heaven. 
But to us, we know the truth, that there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it? Here's the contrast, verse 7. So remember in verse 1, we have knowledge. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. So we know that God is one and that Jesus Christ is the way that we can get to him. And the Holy Spirit enables us and in bodily dwells us. We know all these things. Verse 7 says, though, how be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol, awareness of the idol, are, are knowledgeable of the idol. Unto this hour they eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. So they are aware, they have knowledge of the fact that there is an idol that they're bowing down to. And we've experienced that. We, you know, we learned that about a lady with Mary and all different things. And the people at the Chinese food store, they got their little cat, right? They're aware of the idol. And, and, and they bow down, or, or, at least, or at least they offer these things unto their idols. And their conscience, which is weak, is defiled because they do it. Verse 8 says, But me commendeth, or proveth us not to God. So the meat, the food, what I eat does not prove me to God. It doesn't commend me to God. If we eat, are we the better? Neither if we eat not, are we the worst. So before God, what we eat here seems to be signifying it, it doesn't change our position before him, right? Meat commendeth us not, right? God commendeth, proved his love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Meat commendeth or proves us not to God. For neither if we eat are we better, neither if we eat not are we the worst. What we eat doesn't prove us one way or another before God. That's what the Bible's teaching here. But take heed, now here's the warning, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So we, we, we have Job that's got his idol that offers his food unto his idol and eats it. His weak conscience is defiled. We have the Christian who has nothing to prove before God by what he eats or doesn't eat. But here is the rub. Take heed lest your liberty, Christian, that you have before God and that you're not judged by what you're eating, take heed lest your liberty become a stumbling block unto the guy that's bowing down to an idol and you're trying to reach. Does that make sense? Don't make that guy stumble because his conscience is weak and defiled. He doesn't have the same knowledge of Jesus Christ to you, but we all want him to, right? We all want the guy with the idol to turn from his idols to serve the living and true God. But when we are living out the liberty that we have to eat whatsoever we will, that's sanctified by the word of God in prayer, that God hath cleansed, that call not uncommon. When we have that liberty and we do it before somebody who has a weak conscience, we, we confuse the issue. We add a stumbling block. Because it's a very religious, outgoing thing that the person does when they're doing it before their idol, right? And if we're just over here in our liberality, knowing the truth, eating and enjoying that, they look at what we've done and connect it as a religious activity. And then they're wondering and they're stumbling upon, why is the Christian that says there is one true God and Jesus Christ is his access to him? Why is that Christian eating to my God, my gods, my, my many gods? My, why is he eating the same thing that I just sacrificed unto my idol? Verse 10 says, for if any man see thee which has knowledge, and look, this is going to explain it even better than I could just now. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered unto idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against, and it doesn't say God here, remember, because we don't commend ourselves before God one way or another, but it says this, when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. 
So the, ob the object here was that they were pulling out people, getting them saved, trying to bring them over to doing things according to the Christian way, according to the scriptures. But they were confused because they kept doing the things that they had always done, sacrificing in their temples. Maybe they were, maybe they were going to, to, to Catholic events and they were, they were sitting, they were doing their, their, their ritualistic sa sacrifice of the, the, the cookie and the and the Jews and that sort of thing. Maybe they were going and they were doing whatever the Hindus do in their ways. They, they were doing the, the halal thing or whatever that the, the Islamic people do. And they were doing all of those things and yet they were getting saved and they tried to bring them over to the right side to knowing certain things and they were just confused by the fact that they couldn't understand why the Christians were doing the same things that they were. They were they were knowingly eating in the idol's temple, which they seemingly have liberality to do, and yet it was causing them to sin so against the brethren. Verse 13 really brings it all into focus. Regarding that first statement that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth, verse 13 says this, and this is kind of the end of the matter. Wherefore, if meat make thy brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So the bottom line was that charity, love, edifieth and encourages. So if I go, say I just got a Muslim person saved, and I go to their house, I'm like, hey, let's fry up some bacon. You see how I have liberality to do that in my own house? But if I'm coming to his place, and he comes from a world where that just isn't right, he doesn't have knowledge of the fact that, that God has cleansed all these things. And now I have offended my brother, and he's wondering why I would do something before him. Maybe he doesn't even want to come around me anymore, because he's always understood, as they do, that the Old Testament even teaches these types of things. And so I have restricted my fellowship, I have offended my brother, and I've caused a great error and a schism to come between us. So the Apostle Paul says this, hey, I can do without flesh if eating flesh is going to make my brother to offend. Why? Because charity edifies. These people don't all have the same knowledge that I have, so I'm not going to use my liberality to sin so against the brethren in this fashion. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 continues, and it says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. So this is putting others first, right? Whatsoever is sold in the shambles... So this is the grocery store. This is the marketplace. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you. So you go to an unbeliever's house and they set food before you. Eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But... Verse 28, if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it. Because remember, we're not commending ourselves before God for it, but we're seeing the person that invited you over. And they said, I just offered this meat in sacrifice unto idols. Eat it not for, not for, for his sake that showed it and for his conscience sake. Why? For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's going to highlight this in verse 29. Conscience, I say not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Wherefore, whether you eat or drink, and whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. So the stumbling block that came before the children of Israel and the church of Pergamos at this time was eating meat sacrificed unto idols. Do you know what I believe that it did? They were living in a worldly, carnal area where Satan dwelt. He ruled. This is like Sin City. They're living, their church is planted in Las Vegas. Hey, in Toronto, we're not that far off from just being a cesspool of wickedness and filth. But say the worst place you could type would be Las Vegas, and they're dwelling in it, in and amongst those people. Fornication is rampant. We all know that, right? Sin City. So they're to stay out of those things, and yet that's a stumbling block that was placed before them. The next is eating meat sacrificed unto idols. And you can see how as they're trying to reach people, but they're partaking of the same things, how that might be a conflict. 
And so, therefore, it's not always, because we see the Bible t teaches liberty. Liberty to eat. Eat whatever's before you. Go to the marketplace. Eat whatever's before you. Don't ask questions. Don't ask things for conscience sake. But if someone comes to you and says, hey, this is meat sacrificed unto idols. Hey, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I can just say, okay, well, now that you've said that, I'm not going to eat this. But God's got a fullness of earth ready for me to eat something else. And I can, I can buy good conscience of the man that I'm standing before, say no and still be fed. I can give not offense to him because I've made that good and right decision. So then that's where I say fornication absolutely is applicable today. And meat sacrificed unto idols and not partaking of them is sometimes applicable. And more often when you're in a worldly carnal situation where almost everything around you seems to be presented as some meat sacrificed unto idol, or people are laying their statues before you in, in, the, in the grocery store or in the food marketplace or everything, you can see what things might be and what things might not be offered in sacrifice unto idols. You can make the choice there. What we need to understand Understand is that we have liberty to partake and to eat whatsoever. It's sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. This is why we pray before our meal, to see if the Lord would cleanse our food. And the word of God has said it so. Whatsoever is found in shambles, eat asking nothing for the conscience sake. But we need to understand that the world is watching. And therefore, when we walk into you know, the, the, the Buddhist Chinese store and there's the kitty there. And we're, it, it just, it looks strange, especially to a brother who just turned from a religion and then he sees you going and partaking of it. Maybe he has more understanding of the thing than you do. Maybe he knows that the food is, is prepared in a certain way and it's very sacrilege. So we can see how we may offend somebody, especially when we're in a super world area. But trust, Christian, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So we can partake. Just be cautious. Just be aware we're not offending brother. We're not offending other people. We're, we're keeping a clean conscience before God. Not commending ourselves. Not being proven by what we eat or don't eat. Because that seems to be an Old Testament ensample that I believe was only used to be a heaven or a worldly picture of a heavenly truth to get peter on board and understand that the gentiles too could be saved but we need to be be just have a good standing before the community uh, don't don't have don't have a pig roast if you're trying to get your muslim friend saved it just it just doesn't make sense to offend in that way if you can just abstain from it as the apostle paul taught so the pergamus church and I'll wrap this up pretty quickly. If you would, go back to Revelation chapter 2. The Pergamus church literally had the seat of Satan there. He was literally dwelling among them. He ruled. He also heavenly influenced them towards worldliness. You can see how that draw would be there. We're not always in church. And when we step out into the streets of Toronto, immediately we see billboards and signs and people that are all trying to draw us towards the direction that the ruler is trying to take us in. In this case, in the Pergamum church, it was Satan himself. Therefore, this church, as we do, need to have faith unfeigned. We need to have a sincere faith, one that acts out in all three realms, our body, our soul, and our spiritual needs. It always comes in those three tiers, and we're fully engaged, fully set, unfeigned, without wavering in the faith that is before us. Sometimes, though, we need to understand that our sincerity doesn't necessarily mean that we are standing. This is why the devil finds it so easy to put stumbling blocks in front of Christians, because every one of us take heed lest ye fall, right? We can all succumb more directly by the things that we sinned in in the past, but new sins could be put before us in temptations that we could also succumb towards. But even though this church was worldly, their charge was the same as the other church. We see then in verse 15 that thou also hast them that hold the, doc the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate. So they had some sort of segregation in their church where there was a king over top of the laity. And they were dividing themselves asunder in that fashion and, and living in that fashion. In other words, one is going to have a higher standard for living than the other. But really we're all just different. We have the same responsibility, but we're all essentially one in the eyes of God. We're all just believers following Jesus, and God puts leadership over us that we could follow as they follow Christ. And that's the proper order of things. But Nicolaitans is different. You can study more into that, but it, it seems to be kind of this like dictatorship overhead that gives rules that are above and beyond what God would even require. Here at the church, they knew the name of Christ. They did not deny the faith. But they were worldly, or at least they were susceptible to the worldliness. 
Verse 16 charges them, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So here, they're charged to repent, or else they will be fought against. The very word of God that was to be their power, to be their strength, to be their guiding force, would be turned upon them were they not to repent in this area. Who was being charged here? The leaders, the ones who knew better, the ones who had the ability to cause to stumble. And this is why it's important that as we grow as Christians, we recognize that whether we like it or not, we are becoming leaders to somebody. If I've been saved for one year, I am a leader to somebody that was just born again. If I've been saved for 20 years, I am a leader to somebody that's been saved for 10 years. And so all of these things regarding, regarding fornication and encouraging against that, or regarding meat sacrifice unto idols, are areas where we need to look at ourselves and reflect and not make our brother to offend. And there's many more ways. It doesn't just have to be the deeds that were specifically mentioned in regard to our friend Balaam here. Rather, stumbling blocks are all over the place, and we don't know what things would cause one brother or another to stumble. So therefore, we need to mind our testimony and how we act in front of people, and we need to try to always exhibit the Christian uh, respect and Christian responsibility of leadership that comes upon each and every one of us. The ones that know better shouldn't cause the others to stumble is the overlying message you hear regarding the church of Pergamos. Great and deep scripture, and if you read down to verse 17, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And you see here that the ones that are leading, the ones that are, are, are trying to be an example unto those that follow after them, are the ones that receive more of the good and hidden and blessing and deep things of the scriptures. These are gifts that no man knoweth. Remember we, we talked about in regards to the meat sacrifice on our eyes. There were some that knew and there were some that knew not. And the ones that knew were supposed to mind themselves so as not to hinder the ones that did not know or have knowledge in that area. In the same way we see those that keep themselves not denying the faith, keep themselves holding fast that name, but also keep themselves from stumbling over the world that's around them. In other words, their testimony is aligning with their profession. Those ones are given more. To whom much is given shall much be required, but also God will give more unto those people. And that's what I see in verse 17. You see something like the hidden manna. That's something that I don't have any understanding of. I can't go to the scriptures and find the doctrine of the hidden manna. But it's probably there. And if you dig and you learn and you study and you're yielded unto God, he'll give you that understanding of what the hidden manna might mean. The white stone, again, it's this great thing that nobody really has a lot of understanding of. But here I believe even this is contained in the scriptures. And if you're one that is holding fast your profession, not denying the faith, but also has the, the wherewithal to not stumble over the world around you and you're walking in line with your profession, God will reveal unto you the same white stone, that new name that nobody knows. And it's greater, deeper, and more wonderful understanding. And it comes by way of the obedience to Christ and by the ignoring of the world around you and not succumbing to the stumbling blocks that they're offering. Uh, thank you.